So starting off, we have a couple of basic terminologies that we'll be using in this presentation. The first one we have is threat, which is basically an event or an action that has got the ability to compromise the system or to violate the security. Then we have exploit, which is basically a way to breach the security of a machine through a loophole or a vulnerability. Then we have vulnerability, which is generally defined as the existence of a loophole or a weakness in the design or the implementation that could lead to undesirable or unexpected event that would compromise the machine. Attacker. Any individual who compromises the security of the machine illegitimately in order to steal the data or manipulate or to cause destruction of the data. Attack. The action that is performed by an attacker that would potentially harm the system or the information stored in it. Data theft. The action of information stealing from the victim's machine is called the data theft. So, computer security in general has got plenty of meanings, but a couple of uh, two of the major ones would be the ones that we have given here. Basically, computer security is the protection of the computer system from the theft or damage to either the software, hardware, or to the information present on the system. It generally involves the process of safeguarding against the intruders from gaining access to your systems or its resources for malicious purposes. So what are the different laws that would be possible because of the security attacks? The first and most common is the financial loss. It's quite common that most of the banks today or most of the bigger organizations today are having a bigger financial loss because of various different security attacks. The next would be the resource unavailability. It's quite common that once the uh, attacker tries to gain, gets access to the system or the victim's machine, he would make sure that the resources are unavailable for the legitimate users. The next would be identity theft, about which we would be talking in a couple of other slides. But in general, the identity theft is basically a concept wherein an attacker would try to steal the credentials or the information pertaining to the victim and try to impersonate himself as the victim itself. Next we have is data loss. It's quite common that once an attacker compromises the system, he would try and uh, steal the data or try to perform any sort of an attack that would uh, later cause the data loss, loss of the data. Then we have loss of trust. It's quite common that bigger organizations, once they get compromised, it's quite common to see that uh, people would lose trust in that organization in terms of security or any or safeguarding their assets in the organization then resources misuse it is also known that when an attacker compromises the victim's machine first thing he would do is the misuse of the resource that he's got access to elements of security so these are five different elements of security that's really important and based on which the whole security is made of Firstly, it is confidentiality, which basically is ensuring that the information is accessible only to those who are authorized and have access. The next we have is integrity, which is to make sure that the information is accurate, reliable and also complete and it is in its original form. Then we have availability, which is basically to ensure that the information is accessible to authorized persons when and when required without any sort of a delay. Then we have authenticity, which is the identification and assurance of the information's origin. Then we have the non-repudiation, which is basically to make sure that a, any person or an individual or a communication cannot deny that the authenticity of their signature on a particular document. So let's consider the various different layers of security. So firstly, we have physical security, then network security, then system security, then application security and user security. So under the physical security, it basically involves the safeguarding of the personal uh, or the hardware programs or be it the network peripherals 
from the physical threats. The next we have is network security, which would basically uh, be summed up as the protection of the networks and their services from unauthorized modification or destruction. Then we have system security, which is basically to protect the system and the information from any sort of a threat such as uh, unauthorized access or corruption or being misused. Then we have the application security. So this was this would cover the uh, the way the softwares are generally being used or even be it the hardware or any sort of procedural methods that could be taken care uh, for protecting the application. The next we would have is user security which basically is to ensure that a authenticated and an authorized user is only allowed to log in and uh, perform any sort of functionalities is authorized to do. What are the risks that are pertaining to the domestic users? So it's quite common nowadays that the whole world is going digital and it's also quite common that most of the domestic users would be susceptible to these different kind of attacks so the first one would be the email attacks basically the uh, the victim would be uh, susceptible to uh, attacks such as phishing or spamming or any other sort of scams and uh, next we have is malware attacks so right after the email attacks we have uh, malware attacks basically we it's quite well known that emails are the biggest carriers of the malwares so henceforth it falls under the second uh, attacks that the domestic users are susceptible to. Then we have the DOS attacks which is nothing but the denial of service attacks which is basically the unavailability of a surf service for a legitimate user because when an attacker wants to compromise or uh, compromise that machine or that IP address it would bombard that particular IP with enormous amount of packets that the service goes down. The next is identity theft which basically involves an attacker to impersonate the uh, targeted victim and try to uh, use it for his personal gains. The next is packet sniffing. This would involve the attacker to intercept and uh, try to get some uh, information out of the communication that's been happening around. So what are the things that are to be secured? So the first thing would be the hardware. Basically that would include your storage devices or your hard disks or your laptops or your smartphones for that matter. Then you would have to make sure that you secure your softwares as well, right from the operating system to all other applications that come under it. Then you would have the information that is to be secured right from the personal identification uh, credentials such as the credit card details or any sort of health related details or banking details etc. The next would be the securing of the communication right from your instant messaging or any sort of browsing activities or your mails or any activities that you perform on the social media. So what are the things that make your system vulnerable? The first thing would be low security awareness, then no implementation of security systems, then default settings for applications and software, then not following the standard security guidelines, then insecure online activity. So how do you make your system secure? First thing, you need to implement data access controls. So which would basically involve you got to monitor the system uh, activities or activities that happen onto your system you know such as who is accessing what kind of file or what kind of data and uh, the next would be system and security administration so make sure that you always perform a regular check and uh, based on the on the security administration tasks such as whether configuring the system settings or implementing any sort of policies pertaining to security as such. The next we have a system access control. This is basically to make sure that uh, only the authorized users get access to the uh, files that they're uh, allowed to access. 
then uh, next would be the system design which would basically in, uh, include you know different uh, security implementations bring, being brought uh, into the uh, actual uh, software design such as uh, privilege, privilege isolation or any sort of uh, such uh, secure system designs so what are the basic security guidelines so the first would be the use of strong passwords or even the use of strong and complex passwords then you have the use of antivirus then regular backing up of your important files and documents then using encryption and digital signatures then using firewalls and intrusion detection systems then regularly updating your operating system and other applications not revealing too much of information on online social networking sites awareness of the present to world security scenario and new attacks hello everyone in this presentation let's look into the concept of internet security so internet security usually involves the protection of the user's data from the unauthorized access or damage when connected to the internet most of the times implementing a proper browser configuration would help in protecting the personal information preventing malware infection and also prevent damage caused due to a cyber attack so before we get to know more about the internet security it's really necessary to know and understand what exactly are cookies a cookie is basically the information which is provided by a web server to a web client and then sent back unchanged by the browser each time it accesses that server when this website is revisited the browser sends the information back so as to recognize the user this is invisible to the user and also is intended for improving the internet browsing experience so what are the security issues pertaining to the instant messaging so the one would be the social engineering which we would be discussing in couple of other slides then the next would be spamming security measures that could be taken for instant messaging so make sure you do not reveal personal information and do not accept links received from unknown sources make sure to block those users that send you unsolicited web links and make sure you use strong and complex passwords and also make sure that you sign out of your IMs after you are done using it and always make sure to uncheck the remember password option so what are the online risks that are that the children are susceptible to so the one would be misleading URLs and next is the sexual harassment online that would include cyberbullying or any sort of child pornography so what are the risks that are involved with social networking sites so attacker might use the information available about the victim online for cyberbullying or any sort of identity theft the attackers might easily get information such as email IDs con contact numbers or any other sort of information pertaining to the victim so spams the attackers might use the email based attacks to steal the information the email based attacks would include spamming or phishing or any such attacks they would lure the victims in with the spam mails the phishing mails are a trap and most get victimized to it so these are a couple of checklists that are really necessary for the internet security make sure to set up firewalls in order to monitor and control the information and update your web browsers operating systems and applications do not connect to public Wi-Fi to browse any important website such as banking website never respond to the spam mails which is really important and never download from untrusted sources and make sure that you never click on any of the pop-ups that come up on any sort of a website then make sure to update the antivirus regularly and have a regular scan done onto your system and never reveal too much of, of information about yourself or your loved ones on the social networking site in this video let's look into the configuring of google chrome for security so first let's open up the google chrome and here in the options we would see the settings uh, button and in, under the settings option 
so we could go on and uh, check out the different settings that we could do but we would want to click on the advanced settings option so here we could see all the other different options that we have with respect to the privacy so if at all we would want to clear all the browsing data or the history or the files related to that we could go on and select or check all the boxes that we would want to be deleted so once we clear all the browsing data yes we can go back to the settings and see other different options so here it would be the exact settings that we would want to implement in terms of different entities let's say if it is image or JavaScript or uh, downloads or flash or location or anything as such by default most of the settings are set to the recommended ones wherein the browser would always ask you if at all it has to perform any actions but you could go on and uh, change the option uh, however you need or however you want So we could make the changes as per our needs. And once we are done, we could click on the finished button. Or we could just move out of this box. now let's look in to look at a couple of other different settings over here so here now we see the HTTPS or the SSL settings wherein we could see the different certificates that are being trusted by the browser so whether it be the intermediate certificate authorities or the uh, root certificate authorities and uh, we have a couple of trusted publishers and we have untrusted publishers so uh, this is one of the way and uh, now we could go on and uh, check out the incognito feature in google chrome so wherein we could go on and basically use the browser without being tracked in terms of the cookies or the sessions so let's say we get into the gmail.com here we can see that we've already uh, got the page loaded but uh, let's go uh, go on and see how uh, if we are being tracked with respect to the history or cookies or anything as such so when we go and check out the history we see that there are no traces of us browsing this particular website so this was about configuring the google chrome for security in this video, let's look into configuring Mozilla Firefox security. So for that, let's start off with the Mozilla Firefox and uh, go to the options. There you would see various different options and uh, for the starting, let's go with the privacy settings. Now, uh, if at all, we could go and clear all our recent histories but uh, let's go ahead and clear each and all each and every history that has ever been created on the system so once we clear this we can also go and remove the individual cookies but uh, as we have already removed uh, all the traces i think uh, we won't be able to get anything from there so now we would go into the security of it so here we can select various different options so we can uncheck the remember login uh, for the sites which is one of the secure uh, things to do and uh, we can also go on to the advanced settings and try to you know figure out 
various different other settings that we could implement based on the security aspects but if at all you want to get into the security part of it we could use uh, a proxy for which we could manually set the proxy or use a system proxy here and uh, this would be about setting the proxies now if at all we would want to use the private browsing here we can easily do it via opening the private browsing option so wherein we won't be uh, able to be tracked by any sort of cookies as such so this was about config configuring mozilla firefox security in this video let's look into the configuring of internet explorer for security so for that let's open up the internet explorer and go to the settings tab and under the safety options we can go and uh, delete the browsing history we can check and uncheck uh, based on our preferences and once done we can click on the delete option so once we are done with that we can again go back and try out other features that are there but uh, for now let's go on and stick to the internet options to see what are the privacy and uh, security settings that we have got so once we click on the internet options we could see various different tabs but let's go to the security tab and here we could set the security based on our preferences or our choice so whether be it high low or medium and once we set it we can click on ok and go to the privacy tab here we could see which are all the sites for which we could allow the tracking via the cookies and we could also go on and use the advanced options under the privacy settings for that So once done, let's also go back and uh, see the private browsing basically, which is similar to the incognito mode in the Google Chrome, which would allow you to browse without your cookies or history or sessions being tracked. So the next thing that we could do is go back to the internet options again, and uh, we could set the custom level uh, security settings so with respect to the uh, whether to enable or disable the javascript or whether or not to allow the uh, downloads by default or do you want the browser to prompt if at all the file gets downloaded and so on and so forth so based on our preferences and choices we can disable or enable various different options that are present here and this could be set as the different levels of security so once we have set all these different settings or parameters we could go on and uh, click on ok so we could again see whether high medium or low for now let's keep it high and we could click on ok and this was about configuring the internet explorer for security. hello everyone in this presentation let's look into the concept of identity theft so identity theft is basically a crime wherein the attacker would obtain the information pertaining to the victim's identity such as social security number date of birth the driver's license or credit card details etc and manipulate those information for his or her, or her personal gains so what are the information that are at risk the information that would be at risk would be your personal information such as the name address phone numbers or date of birth it would also include your social security number the driver's license the credit card details bank details passport details etc so how would the attackers generally do it? So these are four of the major ways the attackers generally try to do the attack. The first would be the phishing. Phishing attacks generally involve the fake sites created by the fraudsters or the attackers who would trick the victims in giving out their information. 
the next would be the social engineering social engineering is known as the art of manipulating the human emotions and behaviors for getting critical or sensitive information hacking the attackers would be able to get most of the personal information pertaining to the victim if they would be successful in compromising the victim's system or the smartphone the last would be the personal data theft which is basically the information such as credit cards or driver's license or bills or any sort of checks or any other sensitive information that would be up obtained from a stolen wallet or, or a smartphone so what are the frauds that you would be susceptible to the one would be the financial fraud which is quite obvious when any such attacks happen the next would be any sort of credit card frauds such as card skimming or card cloning etc then the next would be the frauds that are pertaining to the government documents so next we would know more about is the social engineering so social engineering is known as the art of manipulating people in giving out confidential information this basically depends on the mental ability of the attacker who could perform such an attack on to the victim the attacker would be possible to gather sensitive information such as bank details health related details credit card numbers passwords or any other information possible so what are the different types of social engineering so the main the major two different types would be the human based social engineering and the computer or the machine based social engineering so under the human based social engineering again we would have shoulder surfing wherein an attacker would be standing somewhere nearby the victim trying to see what password or what the victim is trying to do and the next would be the dumpster diving which is gaining information from any sort of dumps or any sort of things that are thrown away by the victim the next would be the eavesdropping basically it is the unauthorized listening of the conversation between two or more people the next would be the computer or machine based software uh, social engineering so this would include hoax mails or the chain letters or the instant messengers uh, scams or the spam mails so how do we combat the identity theft so the first thing you got to do when you believe that you are been victimized of the identity theft would be you will need to contact your bank and block your credit and debit cards make sure you go and report an FIR at the nearest police station next freeze all your bank accounts notify all your creditors about the identity theft then make sure you change all the passwords of your systems online accounts and even your smartphone so let's summarize what we just learned today So identity theft is generally the process of misusing the victim's information for the attacker's personal gain. Make sure you have all the applications and antivirus up to date and do not reply back to the spam mails. Use strong and complex passwords for all the accounts on the internet and make sure to monitor your credit card transactions and statement. In this presentation, let's go on and look into the encryption. so before we know about the encryption mechanisms and the algorithms so here are a couple of the basic terminologies that we need to know firstly clear text clear text is also known as the plain text which is an unencrypted readable text then we have the cipher text the encrypted text which is formed after the encryption algorithms are run over a plain text is called a cipher text then you would have an encryption key This is the key that is used to encrypt or to decrypt the data and is called the encryption key. So what exactly is the encryption? So it is the process of converting the data into a cipher text that wouldn't be understood by any unauthorized person. So to decrypt the encrypted file a person needs to have access to the secret key or the password that enables to decrypt it. the major use of encryption is to protect the sensitive information during the transmission and storage so what are the key objectives of encryption so the one would be the authentication the origin of the message could be verified by the receiver no other user would be able to send the message to the recipients as the legitimate sender next would be the data integrity 
Once the message is received, the receiver can check whether the message was modified during the transmission or not. The next would be the non-repudiation where the sender of the message under no circumstances would be able to deny that they sent the message. They did not send the message. So what are the primary uses of encryption? So the first would be protecting user credentials, then safeguarding the sensitive information, then provides, it provides a secure channel to communicate, then it provides a higher level of trust during the file transfer, then it also assures the sender's identity. So what are the various different encryption types? We generally have three different encryption uh, mechanisms. One is symmetric encryption, the next is asymmetric encryption, the third one would be hash function. So let's look into the symmetric encryption. So in this type of encryption, the sender and the receiver would have the same key for encryption and decryption. So the, as we can see in the diagram, the plain text gets encrypted using a symmetric key and then the cipher text once it's formed it could be again decrypted using the same uh, cipher key so let's talk about the asymmetric encryption so in this the uh, the there is an involvement of two or more keys so generally we would use two keys here one is called the private key and the other is called the public key. So the public key here is used to encrypt the messages and the private key is used for the decryption of the messages. So let's talk about the hash function. So here it's basically the one way encryption. So it couldn't it cannot be reversed in the other way. So let's say the input is fox. It is run through an algorithm, a hash function, and is converted into a hash sum. So on the second line, we could see that the sentence, which is the red fox runs across the ice, is again run through the hash function, and we would get a hash sum. So similarly, this hash sum could not be reversed back to the actual plain text. So digital signature. So digital signatures usually implement the asymmetric encryption in order to simulate the security properties of a signature in digital instead of, instead of using the written format. There are two keys involved in this process, a private key for signing the messages and a public key for verifying the signatures. The digital signatures are mostly used in the electronic signatures implementation. So, working of the digital signature. So, the hashing algorithm basically creates a hash value to which the, sender, uh, the sender's private key could be used for signing the message. Once the message is signed, the signed message could be sent out to the receiver and that could be uh, rechecked using the sender's public key. So, this is how the digital signature generally works. So the summary, so encryption in general is the process of converting the data into a ciphered data. Symmetric encryption uses just a single key for both encryption and decryption. And asymmetric encryption uses two or multiple keys for encryption and decryption known as private keys and public keys. A hashing function is a one-way encryption method where a cipher data cannot be reversed back to its actual form. A digital signature is an implementation of the asymmetric cryptography. Hello all, in this video we will look into the sandboxing, basically running applications and opening directories in an isolated mode. So for this we would be needing a tool called as Sandboxy. So there are plenty of tools out there but we could download Sandboxy from the website shown in this uh, video. So it's a very simple downloading and installing uh, kind of a procedure and uh, once we download it so we could just run the .exe file 
and uh, go on with the installation process. So now that the installation is complete, let's go on and start off with uh, using the sandboxy tool. So we would be uh, given out various different options to try in this. But uh, let's go and finish this installation and uh, let's start off using this. So first thing would be, let's say we have been given an unknown USB device and uh, you would, you are pretty much scared to open it normally, scaring off any other sort of viruses. So you could run it with uh, in the sandboxed mode by right clicking and running it via sandbox. So once you run it, the USB device would be opened up in an isolated environment. So now that we can see that the uh, yellow colored uh, border for this particular dialog box is basically indicating that this is being run under a sandbox mode. So let's go on and try making some changes onto this. So let's create a new directory and uh, just name it as uh, test directory. So once we are done, we know that we are running this under the sandboxed mode. And let's go on and see under the normal mode if that directory is present. So that directory did not get created under the normal circumstances, which means that any changes that's been made under the sandboxed condition won't get uh, affected in the normal actual mode of the system. So on the other hand, we could also go on and try uh, browsing using the sandboxed mode for which we can open up the sandbox to web browser. So once we click on the icon, we would uh, be seeing the sandbox to web browser again. So on the borders, you could see that you could see the yellow colored bordering, which means that this is running under sandboxed mode. So you could open up any website or any file that, that gets downloaded would uh, never uh, sort of you know uh, affect the actual system. So this was basically running the uh, browser and directories or the folders under the sandboxed mode. Hello everyone. In this video, let's look into the scanning of files using online virus scanners. So for this, we would be needing any file. So here on our desktop, we have a file.apk, which is an Android application package file. So we would go to www.virustotal.com and uh, we are going to be uploading our file.apk onto this uh, website. So we could just go and uh, and drag and drop and once done we can click on scan it option so we get a pop-up box that says that file this file already exists and we could go on and reanalyze which means that this file was already analyzed using uh, the virus total by someone else so under the reanalysis we see that there is a detection ratio of 1 out of 11 now which means that one antivirus out of 11 antiviruses said that this is a virus. Let's just wait until all the antiviruses give out their report on this file. So now we can see which are all the antiviruses have said that this file is non-malicious. So the ones with the green tick say that this file is completely safe. So we have uh, the detection ratio to be 2 out of 58, which is really good 
which mean which is close to four percent and uh, which means that uh, the the possibility that this file being non malicious is really high so once the analysis is done we can go on and see and here we could see uh, the user ratings uh, whether if the users voted it as malicious or non malicious we can get couple of other file related details as well so as this is an apk file we could go on and see the different features of this file that include the uh, metadata information or be it the android uh, manifest.xml uh, file and uh, various other information so we could also see if this file has got any sort of relationship with any other uh, files and we could here get the md5 hash or the SHA1 or SHA256 hash of this file and we could also see if uh, anyone has commented on this file or even we could go and give a comment once we sign in so this was about analyzing files using online scanners called virus total in this presentation let's look into the concept of secure online shopping so the possibility of ease in shopping and also the ability to compare the products and prices at one go has made the online shopping the best place for consumers. People who shop online generally prefer buying using the credit cards. And credit cards are still preferred for online shopping because of, the, of their flexibility that they provide to buy the goods instantly. And the major reasons for online shopping would be the availability of the uh, product and the elaborate product description with reviews and comments from various other users and uh, coupons on or deals available for that particular product and then the option of quick buying. So when we consider the uh, online banking, so it's basically the process of transacting or paying the bills over the internet. The users are generally allowed to make deposits or withdrawals and also food the bills with a single click on the internet. So when we consider paying with the credit cards, it's still preferred as the best mechanism for online payment. And it is used vastly due to its ease of use and also for the ability it gives to pay the bills for a later date. So when you consider the credit cards, it also comes with the uh, credit card frauds that uh, surrounds the whole ecosystem of the credit cards itself. So considering this, there are a couple of very well-known credit card frauds such as the credit card skimming or cloning, then the stolen card fraud, then you have the shoulder surfing, then you have the identity theft and many other frauds. So when you consider credit card skimming or cloning, the attacker would generally clone the credit uh, the victim's credit card without his or her knowledge and under the stolen credit card fraud it would basically be that uh, the attacker would try to take out as much as money possible out of the stolen credit cards then under the shoulder surfing an attacker would try to get all the credentials pertaining to the credit cards just by standing beside or near the victim so under the identity theft, it's basically again, the attacker tries to manipulate various different documents or tries to steal the document or the identity of the victim itself. And there are plenty of other more credit card frauds uh, when it comes to the uh, credit card industry. So there are a couple of secure practices that could be done in terms of the credit cards. The first would be do not share your credit card details with any other. Keep track of all your transactions and make sure to check if the site that where you are uh, performing your online shopping has the basic security implementation such as the HTTPS or the SSL. Check if the site is of a well-known and a trusted organization and make sure you do not buy from any shady or unknown uh, websites and make sure you do not share more information about yourself on the social media platforms and make sure to use a strong and complex password and also with the OTP or the two-factor authentication 
The next would be check for a confirmation email after you have made a purchase or a transaction. So, couple of things to keep in mind for transacting securely. So, you need to be using the digital cash or also the e-wallets would be a better option for securely transacting. The possibility of getting connect conned with a digital cash or an e-wallet is very less. The built-in feature of the e-wallets prevent theft of the personal data. But before you transact using your mobile wallets or digital cash, make sure that you have installed these applications from a trusted source. So is your mobile wallet secure? So do gather some information about the mobile wallets application before you install them. And you make sure that you install them from a trusted application store and uh, make sure you implement a strong and complex password for the application. And also you got to make sure to check that the mobile wallet websites uses protocols such as HTTPS for transferring the data over the encrypted channel. So when you consider the HTTPS or the SSL, so these are a couple of its features that you need to take care about. First, the secure socket layer, the green colored HTTPS written in the URL bar shows that this site is under uh, the HTTPS encryption. The padlock symbol shows that this site is completely secure and could be trusted. So how do you trust a website? So the websites need to have the HTTPS as a prefix in the URL. The identity of the organization could be found from the certificate used to encrypt the connection. Click on the padlock symbol on the URL bar next to the HTTPS prefix. So you could view the certificate so that you can get to see some of the uh, see the authenticity of the certificate. So how do you not trust uh, any website? So that would be uh, with the following two methods or two or more any number of methods. So the major ones would be when you get asked for proving your identity by verifying your credit or debit card before you do any sort of a purchase or you even start the purchasing process itself. So there would be any sort of schemes that are offered by such websites seem to be suspicious. So these are a couple of secure transaction checklists that you got to keep in mind. Make sure you use virtual keyboard to enter confidential information. Never ever transact using public systems such as airport under, under airport Wi-Fi or coffee shops. Never use to always make sure to use two-factor authentication and make sure you have updated your operating systems and your browser and also to make sure that use strong and complex passwords and always perform a regular antivirus scan on your system and please make sure to check for HTTPS on the site URL before transacting and also do not respond to the spam or any sort of an unsolicited emails. Make sure you get a notification from your bank whenever you perform a transaction. Check the address bar for the right URL and make sure you don't give out information under stress or pressure and beware of the phishing mails or any sort of scams that happen on the social media and make sure to update your antivirus regularly. Hello everyone, in this video let's look into the concept of securing your emails. So how do emails generally work? Emails or the electronic mails are a methodology that involves exchanging of the digital messages from one individual to one or more individuals. The email accounts could be accessed via any web browser or a standalone email client such as Microsoft Outlook. So coming to the email security. So always remember that no email communication made is ever totally secure. The insecure emails allow the hackers to be intercepted. Emails are one of the major sources of spreading malwares, viruses or any other malicious programs. Securing emails in order to have safer communication and also to protect the privacy is of primary importance. Threats. The following are some of the threats that are pertaining to the email security. So the first one would be the ma malicious email attachments. Basically, 
it's quite well known that the emails are the biggest carriers of the malicious attachments which tend to compromise the user's system. The next would be phishing. So phishing mails are the ones that generally lure the victim to provide any sort of their personal data. The next would be spamming. So basically the user may receive any sort of a spam mail or an unsolicited mail that would contain a sort of a malware allowing the attackers to take control of the victim's system. The next would be the malicious user redirection. Basically this would involve the uh, mails that would contain links to the websites that would host malwares. The next would be the hoax emails. Here the user may basically receive a hoax email telling any sort of false information to the victim. So malicious attachments. So most of the times the email attachments are found to have been diagnosed with the malicious attachments. So most malicious attachments usually install the virus, trojan, spyware, worms, etc. So what are the countermeasures? Make sure you scan all the email attachments before downloading. Do not open attachments with suspicious file extensions and never ever open the email attachments from unreliable sources. Check if the email was received from the actual source itself. Spamming. So spamming basically involves the process of sending unsolicited bulk emails resulting in the overloading of the receiver's inbox. Spam emails generally contain malicious programs that would include viruses, trojans, worms, etc. Countermeasures. Make sure to avoid opening up the messages that are marked as spam by your mailing application. And make sure to use anti-spamming tools. And never open unknown links that are posted in the mails that you feel suspicious about. And make sure to report suspicious emails as spam. Use mail services such as 10 minute mails for small unwanted subscriptions. Do not post using your actual email addresses on any public forums. So what are hoax emails? So hoax emails are the messages that generally exploit the human emotions and behaviors with the non-existent threats. A scam mail would generally ask for personal sensitive information such as bank details, credit cards or debit card details, etc. So procedures for email security. Make sure to use strong and complex passwords. Provide alternate mail address for mail recovery. Using the HTTPS for browser connection is really important. And make sure to disable the remember me or keep me signed in functions. Avoid unwanted email using filters and make sure to digitally sign your mails and clear your spam box regularly and also scan email attachments for malwares before you download. In this video let's look into the protecting of the systems using antiviruses. So firstly any system that is connected to the internet is always at a higher risk of getting infected or compromised and it is always recommended to install the antivirus software onto the system. The viruses can generally hinder in the performance of the system and would also delete or modify or manipulate or cut up the data that is stored in the system. In the meantime, the antivirus application protects the system against the viruses, trojans, worms, etc. So why do we use an antivirus program? So as the whole world today is digitized and most of our important, important documents are stored on the systems or cloud or computers, it is very significant to protect those data. So fending off the mal to fend off the malicious attackers, it is really necessary to use the antivirus program. Also to staying away from the fraudulent websites that would indulge the victims in some sort of a phishing or vishing attacks and also to combat various malicious programs such as worms, trojans, adwares and spywares. So how does an antivirus work? So there are three different or two different methods where an antivirus would work. So the major ones would be the virus dictionary methodology and the suspicious behavior methodology and there are a couple of other methods as well of detection 
whether be it in terms of using machine learning algorithms as such. So the first one would basically include that every antivirus would come in with a virus di dictionary uh, which would have the definition of each and every virus that they have uh, ever found. So once such kind of pattern exists in the system, the virus gets detected. And another method would be the suspicious behavior methodology, wherein if the antivirus gets to know that a particular application or a program is trying to act in a suspicious way, it would consider that application or, or the program to be a virus. So let's see which are all some of the well-known antiviruses that were uh, really good in terms of defending against uh, various different uh, viruses, worms and trojans and a couple of other attacks as well. So the first one we have is the Bitdefender, then we have the Norton by Symantec, then we also have Kaspersky, Avast Pro, then ESET Nord32 antivirus, then F-Secure antivirus, then Trend Micro antivirus as well. So how do we choose the best antivirus application? So there are three different things to consider, th consider this. The first one would be the antivirus detection accuracy. We got to see that how accurately the antivirus is able to detect and also quarantine the virus. The next would be the scanning speed. At what rate is the scanning uh, or of the whole system or a particular directory or file is taking place? And next would be the resource utilization, wherein it would come in handy if it is going to consume very less of memory uh, so that all the other applications would be e easily able to access the memory as well. So how do we choose the best antivirus application? So we got to consider these different factors uh, before choosing the best antivirus application. One would be the automatic updates of the antivirus system because every day we get to see various different lacks or millions of uh, uh, viruses that are being uh, that are coming out in the wild so for which it is necessary to uh, have automatic uh, updates for the antivirus application the next would be the spyware detection and prevention mechanism that should come in inbuilt as uh, as part of the antivirus application itself it should also have things like email scanning or hacker blocking or then also the bi-directional firewall and then also a good technical support and must also have a parental control just to keep uh, a watch on the kids so that they don't become part of any sort of a malicious activity or become victimized of any malicious activity and then the last but not the least is the ease of installation So these are a couple of antivirus security checklists that are supposed to be performed by each and every one of us. The first thing would be to enable the real-time scanning in order to make sure that any sort of virus or worms or trojans do not attack at any particular point of time. Then to make sure to enable the firewalls and always make sure to, to schedule the scanning, then always also make sure to update the antivirus software to make sure your antiviruses is efficient and make sure that you do not install multiple antivirus uh, antivirus programs on your machines simultaneously as part of configuring and installing the antivirus let's take an example of using the not 32 antivirus so you could directly go and download the trial version or the full version so the installation process is pretty simple just need to click on the exe file and run the whole installation package so once you click on the installation package it would then then download the whole package Once this whole process of downloading is done, we could start off with the installation process.
so we just uh, we need to agree to the end users license agreement after that we could uh, click on the enable option here and now we can click on the install button so that we could start off with the installation process once it calculates all the needed necessities then it would start the installation process and uh, we just need to wait until it finishes So let's just wait till the installation process is done. So currently we can see that it is compiling all the files that are needed. And uh, so it would ask us various different uh, issues but uh, this is pertaining to the sandboxy but yeah so once the installation is done successfully we could continue and uh, we could start using it but it would ask for the activation uh, key uh, we could provide the uh, one that we have got it once we bought it or we could go on with the trial license for right now let's go with the free trial license which would come for 30 days. So once the verification of the license key is done, the ESET would start, would ask us the uh, email address and the contact details for it. And once we are done with this, we could start off with using the ESET Nod 32 antivirus. So this is uh, taking care of the initialization and uh, everything related to that and once all that is done it would basically start off the scanning process so we could go on and update the virus signature database uh, every now and then we got to make sure that is updated uh, most all the time so once this is done we could also go on and start the process of scanning so under the tools we would see various different sub tools like you know the log files or the watch activity or the scheduler or uh, uh, things like that so we could go on and check out each one of them so we are going to do it in some time so now we are going to get into the setup of this so under this we get the computer of protection and the internet protection so now let's get into the computer protections and the real-time uh, protection that we have got and let's try to configure this so once you get into the real-time file system protection you would see that by default most of the protection mechanism are active but you could go on and select them as per your preference and choice so here you could go on with the strict scan or the normal scan so based on the selection that we do, we also get to see the description. So if at all you want any sort of exclusion in terms of the files or something like that, we could again go on and specify the files that you want to be excluding. So there are a couple of additional parameters as well. So you could go on and check and uh, see if you would be actually needing it then uh, go on and use it or else you could deactivate it so these are the different settings pertaining to the on-demand computer scan so you could go on and set up your own profile if needed uh, for the scanning process and you could also profile the targets so you could also 
select the thread sense parameters required which is pretty much the same with the previous uh, option that we had got earlier then we have the idle state scanning again the same kind of parameters are present here we could go on and select the ones that we need and this would uh, now show uh, the startup scanning basically once the system starts what are the different kinds of scan you want the antivirus to perform so in the similar way you could also perform the scanning on the removable media or the you could also enable the document protection by default and so on and so forth So we also have this option called as HIPS which could be utilized here. Then again the process of updation and all that so you could uh, you know, set your profiles based on your needs. So web and email you could set up your email a client and uh, you know, make sure that all your uh, setup or any sort of information you want will be available at your email. And also you get as the email client protection so whether be it your Microsoft Outlook or anything as such then you get the web access protection again so you can check and uncheck the ones that are needed and that are completely necessary based on your preferences So this would be the anti-phishing protection again if th this is one thing that has to be enabled. So again under the tools as we had seen before you could get to see the log files the proxy server settings you can also con configure the proxy settings here and the also the email notifications so once you give out your email information it would send you the notifications if any changes changes happen. So you also have the gamer mode basically which would require applications to run on the bigger screen as in in the full screen mode so for which you would be needing all that so once you're done you can click on the ok uh, button and uh, go on with your configured setting so this is basically the setup and even under the internet protection as we had seen a couple of seconds back so it's the same uh, settings again here that we could use so once done we can click on ok and we could start the computer scan so this was about setting up the antivirus